All right, so you were dispatched to a very remote area for an injured arborist. Dispatch advises you that his legs pinned under a very large log, approximately been stuck for six hours, complaining of intense pain and nausea. And so just, you know, you arrive on scene with fire rescue, so you have all the resources that would be needed. Once you're on scene, you find your victim with their left leg pinned underneath a very large log and an obvious pain. Do not notice any obvious bleeding. Conscious alert oriented times four, his skin's pink, warm, and dry. 58 year old male, past medical history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia. No known drug allergies and takes lisinopril and fish oil daily. During your rapid trauma assessment, you find the victim with that log across their left leg. With their feet hanging out from the log, they have positive motor. They are able to move everything distal to that injury slightly, but they have no sensory and no circulation below that. Obviously, that is causing quite the compression, reducing blood flow, getting nerve involvement, um, but still some muscles intact and some nerves to be able to still move everything. Secondary blood pressure 114 over 80, respirations 20, heart rates 104, ECG is a sinus rhythm, nothing abnormal on that EKG. 96% on room air, rating their pain a 10 out of 10. In that secondary exam, pupils perla, clear nickel bilaterally, the skin's warm and dry, just a log on that leg causing that intense pain. Uh, or circulation or absent circulation distal to that injury. No sensory, but still some motor. So you were asked what four options are the best treatments for this patient? A large fluid bolus, high flow oxygen, Lasix, analgesia medications, nebulized albuterol, or sodium bicarbonate. So let's break this down. So with crush injury, as for tissue, let's, uh, let's think of this like a sponge. Okay, so if that sponge is already kind of full of stuff, like our tissue, when you push down on the sponge, it makes stuff eject out. So that compressed tissue releases potassium and myoglobin and puts that into uh, the extravascular space and can produce it into more of a circulatory system. Okay, so imagine that sponge, Soaked up with that, you push down on the sponge, works everything out, and that sponge is still laying pressed in that fluidous area. Now, once that sponge would get released, it's gonna soak up other stuff around it. So it could start soaking up electrolytes and just extra vascular volume. Okay, so once that stuff releases, that can cause that patient to become hypotensive because that muscle just overly absorbs, fills everything into every crevice that it has. So pulling all the electrolytes out, pulling all your vascular volume in. So just that release can cause hypotension without actually volume leaving the body. So some complications we can see from that is hyperkalemia from that excess potassium going out into the bloodstream. What we would be looking for there is you know, EKG abnormalities, starting into dysrhythmias, uh, could potentially cause rhabdo from just really all the nasty blood going in, causing the kidneys to ultimately begin to fail, excessive hemorrhaging, and then compartment With a hyperkalemia, what we want to be looking for is that always the key thing of those peaked T waves. So what we want to notice is those peaks. And we want to be looking at the amplitude of that T wave. Just because you would see a really small peak T wave does not warrant that it is hyperkalemia. We're looking at stuff that's over at least a third or half the amplitude of that QRS. So that is the first things that you're going to notice without you know, being able to do blood work, of course. But when potassium starts to get up above its normal range in the low fives, it's getting up, we're going to see those peak T waves. 
Then as things start to advance on, this is when we're going to kind of start be shifting down towards the dysrhythmia. So once we start hitting some higher potassium, you're getting that prolonged PR interval, starting to kind of slow the heart rate down, and then even more excessive peak T waves. So as this begins to pull up everything, it begins to also stretch out the QRS. As this begins to stretch out, that's where we can start seeing this ST depression, the sine waves, and everything's really spreading out. And then as time goes on, you notice that this kind of spreads out and then kind of can begin to almost look like V-fib. So after we're starting to hit these high potassium levels, we're into lethal arrhythmias at that point. Other complications, that rhabdo, okay, so that tissue releases that myoglobin, the kidneys hate the myoglobin. That excess myoglobin gets into the kidneys and will just start to cause excessive renal failure. Okay, so we're, we know when we get into these acidotic states, we're heavily relying on the kidneys to help us do some buffering. But if the kidneys are excessively damaged, a lot of our buffering is starting to go out the window. And then of course, hemorrhaging. So if we have any hemorrhaging, we're gonna control it as we would with everything. Tourniquets, pack the wound, control all the bleeding. And then with compartment syndrome. Okay, so if we were to look at a cross section of this leg, seeing the tib and the fib and kind of some open areas and our nerve channels through here. So vessels, nerves bundled up together. So once that compression would release and that tissue begins to overfill, all those little uh, muscular compartments begin to completely fill. Now we can see where the nerve and those blood vessels are. They're in here and they're really beginning to become compressed. Okay, so even with this patient under that log, there could be some even uh, potential compartmentalization beginning to happen or just overall compression of those nerves and the blood vessels flowing through that leg. All right, so what we need to do for them is begin aggressive fluid. So this is point of care treatment. We're not waiting for rescue to get them out. This is simultaneous efforts. So while rescue, uh, the fire department, whoever's responsible for that is working on removal of that victim, we begin aggressive fluid treatment. Okay, because we're starting to think that, hey, if they've already been compressed, there's no circulation, no sensation, once that releases, the patient's gonna become hypovolemic from that muscular volume uh, expanding, soaking up everything. So we wanna go and put extra fluid into the system because we just know that it's gonna soak it up. So we start putting fluid in there, helping kidneys buffering, all those things. Then we're looking for hyperclean. Okay, so we're having them on the monitor, full ALS care. So we're looking for those peak T waves or that widening QRS complex or that developing bradycardia, the sine waves, ST depression, advancing hyperkalemia, but again, treating that aggressively. So that's where, um, you know, albuterol and calcium um, and insulin and dextrose are gonna come into play for long-term care of very hyperkalemic patients. And one thing we need to be thinking about is at that four hour mark-ish, okay, so the body doesn't have a stopwatch, it doesn't start saying, well, we're only three and a half hours in, we're not gonna be going to rhabdo yet. So around four hours, it can even happen earlier, you know, depending on the research you read, even up to three, two, two or three hours, rhabdo could start to develop. So that's where we're really starting to worry about excessive acidosis, uh, complete breakdown, the kidneys are failing, they're not able to buffer, um, just overall acidosis. Uh, considering that a butyrol in there too, just to kind of make those cells more sticky and receptive to help get rid of the hyperkalemia, if hyperkalemia is noted. Okay, so hyperkalemia, that's where we're gonna have our albuterol calcium, um, insulin. Insulin just helps those cells absorb uh, the potassium to get it out to help buffer, get it out. And then glucose to go with that, because hey, if we're giving somebody insulin, we're gonna make their blood sugar drop. So we're kind of balancing their glucose, using the insulin to 
just kind of help the cells become sticky and bonding. And then tourniquets. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, comments and stuff in social media about you know tourniquet use. Okay, so tourniquets are going to be used not necessarily if there's not excessive bleeding, but if we can't begin putting stuff in to help buffer the body, since the kidneys are out and they're in advanced acidosis more than likely, the tourniquet's put into play to not necessarily make stuff leave, but to prevent that really acidotic and nasty blood from coming back into the circulatory system. Okay, so it's pretty much just saying, hey, keep all the nasty stuff down there while we're getting stuff worked up on here now. Okay, so then that tourniquet application kind of goes into conjunction of once you've started um, you know, some supplemental buffer systems um, with bicarb and fluid and whatnot. Okay, and then that bicarb. The bicarb, its main purpose is it's going to be put in once just prior to releasing that weight. Okay, so that's where we have to get into play of coordinating with the rescue teams. It's not just get in, get them lifted up, get them out as quick as you can. Giving that bicarb just prior to removal. Because once they remove that acidotic blood that was in that lower extremity, it's going to hit the circulatory system. But then the hopes are, as the acidotic blood's coming back through, it's met with that bicarb and it's just buffing, buffering in that vascular system. And then you know, overall, other supportive stuff too. Okay, so if we think about patient is acidotic. Big stuff there is oxygen. All trauma patients need oxygen because all trauma patients are developing acidosis. Oxygen helps with that acidosis, with that rightward shift of that oxygen disassociation curve, helping create a buffer system. Okay, and then just supportive care. Whether that's physical, mental, you know, comforting the patient, keeping them warm, trying to make them comfortable while they do everything. And a big one here is for pain. And that was... Um, on all the socials, that was a big conversation of people debating of withholding pain management. Um, then there was also the conversations of uh, they don't believe that they're in a lot of pain because their blood pressure is not high. Okay, so if we go back to that systolic pressure of 114 on a heart rate of 104, they could be compensating at that point. Okay, so there's yeah, there is uh, research that shows when you're in pain that your blood pressure can acutely go up, but was that pressure supposed to be low, but then that sympathetic response from all the pain is now compensating excessively um, and making that blood pressure stay up. So if you're taking that away, um, we gotta be thinking about those things too. But we gotta think about pain management that's hemodynamically stable. Okay? But just because that patient's blood pressure is not high does not mean they're not in pain. There's very limited research that actually supports that Vital signs correlate with true evaluation of pain. Actually, quite the opposite, that we are underdosing and under-evaluating people's pain because of we're relying on seeing, well, they're not sweaty, or their heart rate's not high, or they're not hypertensive, so we're not going to treat pain. And lots of studies saying we are under-treating people's pain, all the long chronic issues that come with uncontrolled pain. All right, so to break down the answers, the four best options. Yes, fluid. They need fluid for when that compression begins to release. And those muscles are absorbing that volume. We need already some more volume in there to compensate for what they're about to lose. High flow oxygen. Yes, they are in an acidotic state. They are a trauma and shock patient. They need oxygen. Whether the hypoxic or not, again, that goes into helping their body buffer that acidosis. Lasix. Nope, we already have you know, compromised kidneys. They will probably need dialysis eventually, but Lasix is not your go-to for it in this spot. Pain medication, absolutely. They're in excruciating pain. Uh, it's going to be a prolonged effort. There's going to be stuff moving around. They're going to be very uncomfortable. Control their pain. Nebulized albuterol. No. Not there yet. Remember, there were no abnormal EKG findings. We did not see any 
instance of hyperkalemia yet. Okay, so once you start to begin thinking about hyperkalemia, then yes, we can go with the nebulized albuterol. Sodium bicarb, yes. That needs to be given just prior to removing that patient to help go combat the acidosis that's about to occur. All right, so everybody, thanks for tuning in. Uh, so remember, in those crush injury patients, be looking for um, you know, signs of hyperkalemia, signs of blood loss, overall hypovolemia. Um, be looking at EKG changes and treat them aggressively and immediately at the point of contact. Thanks.